I wouldn't call myself a Shakespeare expert or even a knowledgeable hobbyist, but I do have fond memories of some of his plays that I read in high school. My favourite out of the, well, four I remember would have to be Twelfth Night. You're likely familiar with it, but to give a brief summary, the play follows the twins Sebastian and Viola, who are separated in a shipwreck. Viola washes ashore in the kingdom of Illyria, where she disguises herself as a boy and takes on the name Cesario. She takes a job as servant to the Duke Orsino, who is infatuated with the Countess Olivia. Orsino sends Cesario to woo Olivia for him, but Olivia instead falls in love with Cesario, who in the meantime finds herself falling for the Duke Orsino. There's also a subplot involving Olivia's drunken uncle Sir Toby and his friends, and their clashes with a puritanical butler named Malvolio. It's one of Shakespeare's more light-hearted plays, and it has a lot of structural and tonal similarities to the modern romantic comedy, which at least to me reflects how what we enjoy in our entertainment really hasn't changed much over the centuries. Now then, Shakespeare on film. Given the fellow's timelessness, it's unsurprising that there have been efforts to bring his plays to the screen for more than a century. It's also unsurprising that, given how often his plays have been performed, there have in recent decades been a number of efforts to add a bit of a creative or subversive twist to the productions. Usually this is done by transplanting the story into an anachronistic setting, or simply by way of creative costuming and set design. However, I recently came across an adaptation of Twelfth Night that is probably the strangest example I've ever seen of Shakespeare on film. Twelfth Night, like most Shakespeare plays, has been put to the screen many times, the most famous examples being the 1996 version, featuring Ben Kingsley as Feste the Jester, and the 1969 version, which is most memorable for featuring a pre-Star Wars Alec Guinness as Malvolio. This particular adaptation, however, came out in 1991, and is creatively titled Shakespeare's Plan 12 from Outer Space. Hmm, as you might guess, the title is the main reason this film interested me. I do some occasional writing for the website 366 Weird Movies, which, as the name implies, centres on reviewing strange and surreal cinema. I'd personally enormously recommend it if you're interested in unconventional films. Needless to say, the site regularly receives recommendations for oddball films to review, and until recently they would post a weekly list of reader-suggested films that they still had to get to, though they eventually stopped since it was getting so long. The list was immense, and mostly consisted of extremely obscure titles, but out of all of them, this one stood out to me. After all, the title was so wonderfully absurd, and it combined two things that I really enjoyed. Shakespeare and campy cinema. Googling it though, there wasn't much information out there. There was an IMDb page with cast info, but no reviews. The only reliable information came from a description of a full upload of the film on YouTube, and from a blog post by David Nigel Lloyd. Lloyd is a folk musician who has been described as the iconoclastic loner of acid folk, and who is credited as one of the film's four contributing writers. It was thanks to him that I was able to learn, well, anything about this film. As for the director, though, a man who calls himself Spike Stewart, well, there's almost no information out there about him, or even any pictures. The ones I have were sent directly to me by Mr. Lloyd himself. Stewart's only other directing credit on IMDb is DUI, a documentary about the Los Angeles performance art and music scene in the mid-80s. Lloyd described Stewart as a charming and funny man, as well as a magnificently loud and stupid guitar player. Lloyd related to me how he was introduced to Stewart by John McAdams, the drummer of his Mohave Desert Cayley band. As he told it, One day, while I was staying with John in LA, Spike called him, However, I answered the phone. Remembering that he liked my voice, Spike told me that he was making a movie version of Twelfth Night, and asked me to read for the part of Antonio. The first read-through took place in March, I believe, in a torrential LA rainstorm. Next morning, Spike offered me the larger and more demanding role of Feste. Like a fool, I accepted. I have never regretted that decision. In addition to playing the role of Feste, however, Lloyd was also responsible for composing the music for the in-text poems. Lloyd's wife Geeta, an artist, was also drawn into the film's production. 
She created several illustrations of the film's characters and backdrops, a number of which are very subtly cut into the film throughout. As for the rest of the cast, well, they're quite surprising. The film isn't exactly packed with highly marketable names, but still, there are some folks here who've been in some pretty big productions. Malvolio, for instance, is portrayed, with an unusual amount of camp for the character, by Frank Doubleday, who you might recognise as the Manic Romero from Escape from New York. Duke Orsino, meanwhile, is portrayed by Billy Hayes, best known especially at the time as the author of Midnight Express, a book based on his experiences in a Turkish prison, later adapted into the cult film of the same name, in which he was portrayed by Brad Davis. The priest character is portrayed by Buck Henry, an established screenwriter known for co-creating films like The Graduate and series like Get Smart. The list goes on, but in general, it's surprising how unknown Stuart is nowadays, considering he clearly had enough clout in the industry to pull some respected individuals into his project. Less surprising, however, is how unknown the film itself is. After all, it's, well, very niche. Psychedelic is an overused and overly simplistic word, but it does give you a general notion of this film's approach. Overall, a recurring theme of this film's presentation seems to be making the action deliberately difficult to discern. The movie makes generous use of filters. Sometimes the scenes are black and white and overlaid with artificial film grain. Other times they're oversaturated and soaked in neon. In addition, the film's main image is often placed over some moving backdrop or other, often as a simple but creative means of conveying the setting. Combine this with some wild and unruly camera work, and the effect is often quite overwhelming. We know the text is being followed, and the actions are all there, but we still feel as if we're watching it all through a strange haze, much like Sir Toby was. As to the setting itself, well, it's one of the most original I've ever seen in any Shakespeare production. In brief, the world of Plan 12 seems to have an intergalactic backdrop. The main setting seems to be some distant rocky planet, with brief exterior shots showing that Orsino's palace is a space station of some kind, and that Olivia's dwelling is an Egyptian-themed pyramid on one of the planet's hilltops. A star-speckled rear projection effect persists throughout much of the film, giving us the recurring impression that the characters, even in the play's quietest moments, are hurtling through space. It's all presented in a very retro-futurist style, too, which, combined with the use of black and white film, really calls to mind old science fiction films from the 50s. This, incidentally, is probably the closest the film comes to referencing Plan 9 from Outer Space, a rather infamous low-budget sci-fi film that the title is obviously a nod to. Precise details of the setting are kept rather vague, due to a combination of a limited budget and the deliberately disorienting editing style that pervades the film. This, of course, serves to make the film all the more surreal. We've shown just enough of the setting to know that it's completely bizarre and unconventional for a Shakespeare adaptation, but never enough for it to feel solidly defined within itself. All you really know is it's quite different from any backdrop we've seen for any Shakespeare production in the past. The IMDb description for the film, apparently written by Stuart himself, describes this version of Twelfth Night as having been reimagined in a child's version of Hell. It seems an odd description at first, but watching the film, it starts to make a fair bit more sense. The hellishness of the film setting comes, like in many children's nightmares, not from obviously grotesque or horrifying imagery, but from that general sensation of being befuddled, lost, confused. The film does a good job of overwhelming you with the kind of sensations that a child would often respond to by crying, just because they don't know what else to do. And then, of course, there's the fact that many of the scenes were shot with a Fisher-Price PXL2000, a toy video camera intended for children. It's a bold choice and a very literal interpretation of the concept of seeing things through a child's eyes, but it definitely exacerbates the film's surreal tone. But enough about style. What about actual content? For the most part, the film follows Shakespeare's original text very closely, with necessary trimming to fit it into two hours. Alterations are made, however, never so much as to derail the original story, but just enough to lend the production a cheeky and subversive tone that complements the surreal and disorienting visuals. Most notably, David Nigel Lloyd, besides composing the tunes for Feste songs, also wrote a number of doggerel poems, as he called them. These poems are inserted into the film at various points, and serve to summarise certain portions of the plot. Viola says, please, take my clothes, and hand me my disguise. 
Just call me young Cesario now. One of Orsino's guys. It really is quite thematically perfect to assign this task to the man playing Feste, as it builds on the character's established role as the narrator. Drawing on his extensive knowledge of folk music, Lloyd very much evokes the voice of a slightly more contemporary Feste. Like any good jester, his verses are lyrical yet cheeky, summing up the action and describing the characters, while simultaneously slipping in a few snarky remarks about them here and there. In all honesty, I wish the film had allowed Lloyd to work a few more verses in. They're wonderfully witty and a very original way to summarise portions of the plot while feeling true to the spirit of the original tale. This subversive cheekiness continues with the rest of the cast, all of whom take to their roles wonderfully, despite some of them being far from conventional casting choices. Really now, how many directors out there would have the guts to see an actor playing an unhinged, flamboyant punk in a Kurt Russell action film, and then cast him as a puritanical butler? It's a highly unconventional choice, but at the same time, it doesn't exactly go against the spirit of the character. After all, in the original text, once Malvolio is tricked into thinking Olivia is in love with him, and that she wishes to see him prance about in yellow leggings, he immediately adopts a flamboyance and showiness which we get the sense he's been bottling up all his life in accordance with his puritanical ideals. Frank Doubleday, with his vivacious and showy performance, evokes a slightly different Malvolio, one who's just a little bit more in touch with his mischievous side. It's a wonderfully different take on the character that is, nonetheless, very much in line with Shakespeare's text. Not all the performances are this subversive, of course, but they're almost all tremendously fun. Sir Toby, Sir Andrew and Feste, for instance, are all as rowdy and boisterous as they ought to be, but especially memorable is Mariah, whom actress Linda Eve Miller portrays as a spicy Latin woman. When I see you in a church, I want to tell you all of my sins. Not the most PC approach, to be sure, but one which brings a cheeky levity to the subplot, and which lines up well with Mariah's characterization as a seductress. The film, in a nod to how closely these characters and their subplot resemble that of a contemporary sitcom, frequently plays laugh tracks over their scenes, and Miller's ludicrously goofy, sometimes stereotypical performance lines up with this concept very well. And speaking of that laugh track, it's just one of the many metafictional elements that recur throughout the film, which feels fitting considering Shakespeare himself was fond of metatheatre. Sometimes characters will whisper stage directions to each other. At other times, Lloyd's doggerel poems will reference characters' long-term fates and their roles in the story. Behold the bold sea captain Wint, and the lovely maid Viola. He we will not see again, but she'll be a... Boyola. The most obvious metafictional element, however, is how quotes from other Shakespeare texts or stage directions will appear directly on the screen, sometimes even worked into the credits. In my exchanges with him, David Nigel Lloyd referred to the cast and crew of the film as barbarians let loose in the temple of Shakespeare. I can certainly see the merits of this description. The irreverence of this film is obvious throughout, its chaotic energy oozing off the screen as the actors gallivant their way through the script battling the film's trippy visuals for the audience's attention. However, these aren't barbarians looking to loot and raise the Temple of Shakespeare. Rather, they, like everyone else, have arrived to appreciate and celebrate its beauty, albeit in a rather more unruly manner than is traditional. To put it more simply, for all its absurdities and obscurities, this film is clearly crafted by people with a deep love for Twelfth Night and for Shakespeare in general, and it's love that's made clear all the way through, even in the film's most befuddling moments. Shakespeare's Plan 12 from Outer Space is most definitely not a film for everyone. However, should you be an enthusiast of uh, creative takes on Shakespeare, this one is unlike anything you're likely to see anywhere else. There are moments where it feels as if the film's concepts could have been more solidly developed, and others wherein the sheer volume of absurdity just becomes overwhelming, but still, the experience of it cannot be called anything other than extremely unique. 
And regardless of what your overall thoughts of it might end up being, there's no denying that it was a daring endeavour. Stewart, a small underground filmmaker, was willing to take the work of an author considered a historical and cultural icon, who he clearly had great respect for, and reimagine it in the most subversive, irreverent, and creatively chaotic sort of ways. And according to Mr. Lloyd, not only did Stewart spend six years and a great deal of money creating Plan 12, but also endured the ending of his marriage during production. The play it's adapting may be a comedy, but the story behind the film seems more of a tragedy. Well, alright, perhaps that's a bit melodramatic. Still, the point stands. Plan 12 is the classic case of an artist pouring everything they have into a truly daring and unique passion project, only for that project to go unrecognised in its own time, in great part because of how unique it is. Thank you very much for watching. Please consider liking and subscribing. I'll likely be looking at more films like this in the near future. I'd like to extend my gratitude to David Nigel Lloyd for all the information he provided for this video. I've put a link to his website in the description. Please be sure to check it out. His music is phenomenal.